Are you ready for some Jersey? Well, we've got Jersey. The zipper was made here. The light bulb was made here. The color television calls the Garden State home. Everybody wants to know about New Jersey. Sandy beaches, beautiful cities. We even have the Jersey Turnpike. Inventors, music, the movies. You need an exit? We got them too. You want Jersey? This is Jersey. Welcome back to This Is Jersey. I have Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Vinny Lopez here, the founder of the E Street Band, here to talk about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, his experience. So tell me, what was it like being honored by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Um, it's, it's a pretty incredible thing. And now, since I'm inducted, that's like I got a new home out in Cleveland. You know, so when I go there, I get treated with a lot of respect. Do you have a card or something? No, I don't have any card. No, I have just... Just say who you are. Just me, you know, and I bring some folks out there. My cousin lives out there, so we all go every once in a while just to see all the exhibits in there because they always change, uh -huh. and it's always good. It's always something new to see. So how did you find out that the group was going to be inducted? Uh, I got an email before any of that became public from John Landau's office mm -hmm. that says, hey, E Street Band's going in the Hall of Fame and you're going in with them. And then I basically pooped my pants. Now, were you ever concerned <laughs> that the alumni of the E Street Band wouldn't be inducted? Well, I would put enough time in where those albums I play on are testimonials. So when, they, when the guy actually came to my house, he goes, you know, he says, you know, the criteria is 25 years. Well, that year was my 50th year. So I said, oh, I went twice, right? <laughs> You know, but it didn't work like that. Only once. <laughs> so you get picked up. Tell me what happens. You get picked up. They drive you. It was at the Barclays Center, right? It was at the Barclays Center, but we actually uh, stayed at a hotel in New York City. Uh, they sent the limo for Dawn and I. Uh, on The show was on Thursday, so Wednesday. And we got up there early Wednesday, and we hung out, and then there was a party Wednesday night for all of the inductees at this place called the Monkey Bar. And uh, we all went over there. And that was nice. I got to see some old friends I haven't seen in a while. Everybody in the band was there. Uh, everybody in all the other bands were there. And, you know, uh, and that lasted till like one in, you know, in the morning. morning right. And then across the street at the bar where Jimmy Fallon hangs out, there was some friends of mine. So they say, oh, you gotta come over here. They got a piano player. So I went over there. And the next thing I'm, no, I'm there till three in the morning singing songs and just hanging out. We got back to the hotel in New York City at like 3.30 in the morning. Nine o'clock sound check the next morning at the Barclay Center, an hour away. So we were groggy. Everybody was groggy, but we made it to the sound check. Then we had to go all the way back to the hotel, get changed, because we had, you know, I got a nice tux I'm going to wear, you know. Right. Dawn had to get all dressed, you know, so then five o'clock, boom, back there. Then we had dinner and then the ceremonies happened and it was just quite incredible actually playing with Max and myself, you know, two drummers. What's your relationship with the band? Oh, we're, we're all good buddies. Okay. We're all friends, everyone, you know, every... When, like, if, if I get invited to come to a show like Giant Stadium, they say, oh, go upstairs and eat. Well, I eat with Gary and, you know, the, the professor, you know, I mean, those guys, through the years, we've all become close friends. Uh -huh. Now, at these receptions for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, did you meet anyone else there outside of the E Street Band that you were happy to meet or other performers? Well, I was, I was there with Peter Chris. Oh. And I He's hung a Jersey out. guy, right? He's a Jersey guy, and I hung out with Peter, and it was quite enjoyable. Him and his wife and Dawn and I, we hung out. In fact, when we actually went back to the Barclay Center for the inductions, you know, they sent us up to this big room for, they had a big smorgasbord going on up there. And Peter had nowhere to sit. All of everything was crowded in. So I said, hey, shh, shh, over here. So we sat down over here and we just ate and then we had to go in. And, uh -huh. you know, their induction was really great too. Uh -huh. Tom Morello inducted them. Wow. <laughs> so what was it like to perform with Max and the band, and uh, what did Bruce say during this whole time? No, we never talk about past things really when, you know, when I see Bruce. It's how you doing, what are you doing now? 
you know, he knows I'm playing with Paulie, you know, and uh, and he actually heard us at light of day, and he, he liked it, you know. So it's 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 all good, but he was more in the background because it was the E Street Band getting inducted, not him. Right. He inducted us. He told it like it was to everybody. I think he upset Miami Stevie. Oh, gave really? a secret away, uh -oh. but oh, okay. I don't know anything about. I don't know right. about the secret, but uh, it was kind of a secret. So, but it, it was all good. And Bruce, you know, he treated everybody with a lot of respect. It was the first time that I heard, although you say he's mentioned it many a times, where Bruce actually did say Vinny was the founder of the band. In the beginning, Vinny uh, came and asked me to be in his band. Tell me about that. Well, we were actually in a band battle. It was 1966, I think it was, at the Keyport Matawan Roller Drone. Bruce was in the Castiles. We were Sunny and the Starfires. And in this giant band battle with 25 bands, Castiles are set up here and we're set up right next to them. And they played and we said, ah, oh boy, they're pretty good. And then we played and then they had the uh, little Vinnie Roslin was one of the judges and Norman Selden was running the whole thing. But his band won. Norman's band won. We came in second. The Castiles didn't even place first, second, or third, and we were like flabbergasted wow. that they didn't. But we didn't know Bruce in those days. It wasn't until years later when Danny Federici and I, we were playing with Chinook, 67. We had a band called the Downtown Tangiers Rock and Rhythm and Blues Band. And when that broke up, Danny and I, we were on the road doing original music back in those days. We weren't in the clubs playing, you know, copy stuff. So when that band broke up, we actually wanted to do that some more. So we went around looking for bass players and guitar players. And I saw Bruce and, you know, when I saw him, I said, hey, I'm Vinny. He goes, I know, I saw you in Slaying the Starfires. I said, well, we jam at the upstage, come down the upstage. And the next time I saw him, little Vinny Roslin and Bruce, because Danny and I walked in the upstage, went to the top floor and there's Margaret Potter standing there. And the three of us stood there and watched Bruce Little Vinny and Big Bobby Williams on drums, doing their thing, their jam. And we looked at each other and said, well, this, this could, let's go see. So we went up to them after their jam and said, hey, you know, I'm Vinny, this is Danny, let's, let's play. And Tom Potter let us do a set. He was the founder of the He upstage. was the upstage, him and Margaret Potter. And we did a set and after that, we went down to the Green Mermaid and said, hey, let's make a band, you know, we, Danny and I are used to making a few bucks. You want to make a few bucks? And Bruce said, yeah, because he wasn't making any bucks. And we made a band. And it was child, but then it was steel mill. We have to take a break now. We come back. I want to talk about Asbury Park and the music of Asbury Park. We'll do that when we come back. See you right after this. Cool. Welcome back to This Is Jersey. We're on the boardwalk at Asbury Park here with Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Vinny Lopez. I know he likes that title, so I want to be sure I keep saying <laughs> it. Now, I wanted to do this show here in Asbury Park because this is where you started. This is where really music began down at the Jersey Shore. Can you tell us, us young folks who never really experienced rock and roll in Asbury Park in the 60s, and what this area was like back then? Well, the 60s, I'm going to go back to the 50s for okay. you. When I was a kid, you start coming down here and like, for instance, they have the 4th of July fireworks. There was all places to go sit. There was all lounge chairs and beach chairs. And we'd come and they'd take, take me upstairs or I'd go play on the beach. Then I'd go upstairs and we'd watch the fireworks. The circuit was here. The cars went one way that way and down Kingsley the other way. And that's gone. But on the circuit, on every block, every corner, there was a bar. Had a band in it. Now, as I got older, we'd ride our bikes down here. And we'd go watch the bands and go stand outside and listen to them playing. Now we're starting to make bands, Sunny and the Starfires, and we'd still come down here and make. And we tried going to rounds and getting jobs, but we were kids. So they were hiring real bands. Not like we weren't a real band. But you gotta remember too, there wasn't a lot of places here that allowed you to do original music. They wanted all the copy music, the top tens from those days. Elvis, so, the Beatles, and okay. we'll go later. Whatever, but that's what they wanted. They didn't want to hear no original music. Then came when I actually 
got together with Bruce and Little Vinny and Danny Federici, and we started doing original music again. So that Tinker encouraged that, well, right? Well, Tinker, when I met him, we, I had a band called The Moment of Truth. Gary Talent was actually in The Moment of Truth. But we were doing the copy stuff. And Tinker said, God, you guys are really good, but if you ever do anything original, look me up. So, when I hooked up, first words I said to Bruce, hey, you write any songs? Because that's what Danny and I wanted to do, go back to original music. And he goes, I got a few, because he didn't have a lot then, but he had a few. And he was in his 20s at this point? We were 18, 19 years Soon old. Soon after he left Freehold. Yeah, he school. came down here. And we started doing the original stuff. Hence, we weren't getting jobs in the nightclubs here, but we played at Monmouth College for a fraternity. Or we'd, we'd play at Brookdale. Or we'd play at, uh, we'd go to Richmond and play for Virginia Commonwealth University or a festival down there. Twice a month we made money and it sustained us. And plus we had the surfboard factory too that Tinker maintained and still is doing surfboards today. Uh, that helped us and Tinker became like our father. He had the truck, he, we built a PA. We went to California. Getting back to Asbury Park, what are some of the big bands that performed here when you were younger? Leslie West and the Vagrants. We would open for them. Uh, Doug Clark and the Hot Nuts used to play here a lot. Uh, there was another band that played, they were called uh, The Five of Us, but they became NRBQ. So it was guys like these that were floating around playing like at the Hullabaloo, where you could do your own music. Okay. You know, and so bigger bands, of course, all the bands that played at most Epti's shows at Convention Hall, you know, we saw them all there. The Doors, the, uh, the just, just the well, the Stones were here, uh, Dave Clark Five, uh, Spencer Davis Group, all these people used to come and play down here. And that's who we really wanted to come and see. You know, going to see some copy band wasn't it, unless we were trying to steal Clarence from Norman, and then we went to see a copy band, you know. So how many bars do you think were in town that had opportunities for you to play music? Steve Brody's was over here. The Jay Walkers used to play. Uh, that was Billy Ryan and Doc Holliday and these guys. Bill, uh, uh, and they used to draw crowds. Uh, Speed Limit 25 used to play here. Mrs. Jay's always had bands. You know, inside, because where the pony is was Mrs. Jay's. So they always had bands inside, and that was funny because they had the go-go girls in there, but they were the ones you saw on like laughing with the boots and the, in the go-go cage, and then the band would play in the middle of that. And then later on, it became the whatever it was, uh, Roman Arches or whatever it became, but then Mrs. J's, the beer garden, had all the bands playing, you know, and uh, I'd, I'd play with the Acme Boogie Company or uh, J.P. Got Rock, you know. So music was filled in Asbury Park. Yes. So then you leave with the E Street Band, and what happens to the music at Asbury Park? It's still, it's still happening. Bands like Home, like, um, like when we, we went out on tour, all of a sudden Home became, they got popular. People would come see them, but they did, they didn't do a lot of original material. And, in, and it went from, instead of there being hundreds of places up and down the coast to play, to now, where there's not a lot of places for anybody to play. Thank God there's a saint for the kids to go and play. You know, thank God the Pony's there. You can go hear some good music at the Pony, the Wonder Bar. You know, thank God those places are there. But the average band is not going to get in there to play. Where do they play? I don't know anymore. You know, because we always used to could find a hole in the wall where we could go and play and get some things together. Nowadays, it's all done in the garage, I think. Well, what we're going to do is we want to take a break now. We want to talk about your career now and how it's expanded and you're doing some really cool things. We'll do that when we come back. Thank you so much for joining us for This Is Jersey. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to This Is Jersey. My guest is Vinny Lopez, a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, I, the, the infamous question is, what does a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer do now that uh, the band is all over the world and you're somewhat retired. Tell me, what are you doing now? I play with Paulie Whistler here. We have a band called Dog Whistle. 
And we, we play around. We played at the Pony, like I said, the Paramount. We did the Light of Day shows. We are going on the Light of Day Europe songwriters, uh, which will be coming up. But I, I keep pretty busy with that, and I, I play with another fellow named Gary Cavco. We're called the Larita Winos, and we just play at Larita Winery, basically, on Wednesdays, ladies' night. And they pay us in wine. So, you know, I mean, there you go. Some That's things never the, change. Some things never change. We work for gumbo. So, but, you know, I also, and I caddy. You know, when, when the season's here, I caddy for Mark McCormick. And we generally have a good time. We usually come in, so we're qualified again to come in next time and, and it's and it's all good and it keeps me very busy and young really. Now you released a CD several years ago of some of Bruce's music that you played early on. Right. How did that work out for you and is that music going to be revived soon? I was just talking to Tinker about it because we had a record company but we weren't really happy with them so we just said stop it. But we still own, Bruce gave us the mechanicals to the music which is which is great. Um, and when we were doing this, I made sure, and Tinker made sure, because it's Tinker and I who are partners in this, that all of that music was copywritten in Bruce's name. Because none of it was ever done. Right. But now it is. You told me the story about how you had access to that music. Tell me, what was your relationship with Bruce and, and him giving you permission to use that? Well, I just asked him, you know, I said, I was up at Giant Stadium, not this last time I played, but before that. And I, you know, I said, hey, Nobody's doing a steel mill. Can I do it? People want to hear it. He goes, Vin, it's yours. Do whatever you want with it. You know, but doing whatever I want with it, that's great, but I made sure it's all good right, right. <laughs> to do whatever I want with it. And I don't do anything without asking those guys first. Make sure that they're all on the stage with it, you know. And whether or not Bruce would ever do it again, I don't know. I don't think so. He doesn't look back. I know Max is as well, and he's not going anywhere. And I know you performed with Bruce at Giant Stadium. I was actually at that concert, which was phenomenal. Do you ever think there'll be a smaller group that's made up of uh, Bruce Springsteen and Vinnie Lopez? It's, it's hard to say. We, uh, you know, like, if Bruce gets a hankering to do something like that, he'll call me. Because I'm not certainly going to call him and say, hey, why don't we do this? I let him do the decision making. Uh -huh. If he wants to do it, he's comfortable with doing it. And then we will maybe do something. Because he, he, he told me, he says, hey, we're going to do this again. Because he kind of liked the old way. Because I'm more the old way than the new way. You know, I'm not that metronome, you know, where Max is the metronome. Like playing with Max at the Hall of Fame thing was pretty phenomenal because now we had to be. So Miami Steve gave Max and I the best advice there was. Max, you speed up a little, Vinny. You slow down a little and meet on the beat. And we did. And that's all it takes is a little thought, looking at each other. Because that Hall of Fame show, you know, I couldn't hear a thing. Couldn't hear the monitors were just like non-existent. Me and Max, we were all we had. So you'd be looking at him most of the time? Ah, uh, no, you gotta watch Bruce. <laughs> no, you can't watch Max. You can maybe hear his bass drum, but Bruce is the guy you gotta watch because when he goes, you gotta go. Vinny, since we were last together, we've lost two members of the E Street Band that we can't forget, Clarence and Danny. Yep. Let's talk about Danny first. I know you were, I guess you were closer to Danny than, than Clarence. Um, well, we were all on the road together and you become pretty close no matter what when you're on the road you know i mean danny and i and clarence were always the roommates okay or danny and clarence, or me and clarence you know so you know losing like danny uh, when that happened that was a, a big blow i do have a really big connection with danny still with my godson jason his son jason federici and uh you know it's important to keep that going and Jason loves it I'm, I'm Godfather you know mm -hmm. and we always keep in contact Clarence I saw him the last time I saw him was at the carousel when he did the Christmas you were there. Uh, thing I was there and I got to talk to Clarence in the back and just sit with him for a while I found I knew something was wrong with Clarence when I played with the band at the Spectrum it was like the last Spectrum show Right, when they closed the building One day down. they were going to close the building down. And I was hanging with Clarence in his room. And then it came time to play. 
Now it's a big stage, of course. Clarence was way over there. Now Clarence, in the old days, if I'd get up with the band, he'd come over with his sax, he'd pop his sax in my face and like to say, hey, Lopez, listen to this, you know, pop, pop. And then I knew he was gonna do a solo and we'd all be happy and smiling. Well, during that show, Clarence couldn't walk over. He sat in his chair way over there and it was different. So I kind of had an idea something was wrong and then I saw him here and then he was gone, you know? And uh, both guys I never really got to say goodbye to, you know, which is probably more on me than them, but yeah, couldn't get there. Me and Tinker tried the day to go up and see Danny, but the same day we couldn't get into New York, the Pope was there. So Vinny, being a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer now, you have a lot of perks. Tell me about getting all the perks of being a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. <laughs> well, all of the perks, let's see, what are they all? Well, one thing that happens is they get more calls to actually go into charity golf tournaments and to fundraisers to help raise money for whatever their cause is. Like the Boy Scouts, I'll go do a thing for the Boy Scouts. But they put me on a par three hole. Now I get to talk to everybody in the tournament because every group's got to come through this par three. I hit a shot. If they get it on the green inside my ball, they get an extra raffle ticket. You know, I do stuff like that. You know, when I go to these things, they're giving out the prizes. I'll be Vanna. <laughs> you know, I, I show everybody the prize. You know, look, look, see, Phil Filipino. That is a perk, know. that is a perk. You know, and I love doing that stuff. It, 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 it's great. Paulie and I, we go out, we play with Dog Whistle. We're working on a project now. We're gonna try and get a CD thing going. But it's hard this day and age, you know. Paul does all originals. That's why we do it, you know. And uh, that's all I look forward to. The going to the Hall of Fame is always an experience. They treat us really good out there. Um, last time I went out to the Hall of Fame, they gave us tickets to a Frankie Valley show at this beautiful theater. And it was just wonderful. It was great being there. You know, so perks, I get to talk to a lot more people. A lot more people want me to come someplace and do certain things. And it's, it's all good. Vinny, thank you so much for being on the show. I think this is your third appearance on our Yes, show. it is. Thank you for all that you do. Good luck, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. You will see me soon. Right. I'm going to keep in touch. We'll see you as well. Thank you so much for joining us on This Is Jersey.